Good morning, church. So we are in Holy Week, as Jane said. This rather strange week, and we're going to talk about how very strange this day is and this week can be in our lives. Our text today comes from John. Now, the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem is told by several of the Gospels, but we're going to read it today from John 12. Jesus and his disciples had been traveling from Galilee in the north, and they traveled south southwise to Jerusalem. They had a purpose. They were going there for the, the time of Passover, and everyone was going there. So they were on the roads with tons of people. All the crowds were already there. Some of them followed Jesus wherever he went. So some of the crowd was there because they wanted to hang around Jesus. He was already quite popular and was causing some trouble with the Jewish leaders. But others heard about Jesus because they were part of the crowd that was traveling for Passover. Along this journey, Jesus had healed a blind man on the side of the road, and then they went into Jericho, where you might remember the story of Zacchaeus, where Jesus very strategically spoke to one person who had an impact on his whole city. Now, in those days, there weren't hotels to stay in, so Jesus, when he got there to the area of Jerusalem, he went about two miles east and stayed in Bethany at the home of friends. You've heard their names before. In fact, Yvonne preached about them not like, just two weeks ago. Mary, Martha, Lazarus were in that area. And one of the nights they were there, they threw a dinner party for Jesus and the disciples. And we hear about Jesus being anointed. We believe it was Mary who anointed him at that dinner party. We'll talk about that a little bit too, how that plays into this whole week. So Jesus is in that area and then coming into the city of Jerusalem. So let's actually read the text and see what it says. Math, or John chapter 12, starting at verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there. And they came, not only because of him, but they also came to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had just raised from the dead. That happened in very close proximity, time proximity to all of this. So lots of things going on at that time. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Hmm. On account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it because as it is written, and you heard that this morning from our call to worship, it's written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, at first, his disciples didn't understand all of this. It was only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus out from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Yes. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Many of you know that's the opening line to Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Tale of Two Cities. And today we want to acknowledge that Palm Sunday evokes some of that very same feeling in us. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was a season of light. It was also a season of darkness. There were opposite things going on right at the same time. Kind of like our lives. If you remember from Yvonne's sermon two weeks ago, speaking of lament and of joy being held at the very same time in our lives, who of us 
can't testify that that's true of us at some point. We, we might be confused which it is, but in the end, we have to say they're both there at the same time. We actually have a word for this. It's called contronyms. This is a thing that when a word has a completely opposite meaning, just depending upon how that word is used. I'll be curious how many times you'll notice that in this in the coming weeks. I'll give you a couple examples to get you started. The word dust is both a noun and a verb. But when you dust, are you applying dust or removing it? Uh-uh. It depends upon whether you're dusting the furniture or dusting the crops. Here's another one. Seed. If you seed the lawn, you are adding seeds. But later in the summer, after the produce has grown and you harvest it, and you seed your tomatoes, you will be removing seeds. Here's a good, another good one. Fast. Well, obviously, it can mean to move quickly, as in run fast. But if you buy fabric, as I do, that is labeled color fast, it doesn't mean that the color runs fast. It means that there is no color that will run out of it, at least you hope not. It doesn't run either slow or fast. Color fast means it doesn't run, but fast can mean you do run. We also know it could mean to abstain from food, many meanings, but there are two opposite meanings with that word. One last one for you, and then you get to hunt for the rest of them later in the week. Strike. If you're a baseball player, you might immediately think, three of these and you're right. And yet, you want the batter to strike the ball as hard as they can. So it both means to hit something hard, but it could mean to get out after you hit that thing. Contronyms, one word, and it means two opposite things. I want to suggest that Palm Sunday exposes some of these holy tensions in our lives. And when we pay attention to holy tension, we will see it everywhere. We like to think things fit neatly in this box or this box, but more often than not, they hold together when we see the tensions that are in there. Now, some of these tensions we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, they're just interesting to note. Maybe it'll ha help you have a deeper understanding of the historical context. But there are a few of them that are very important to our faith, that we be able to hold them together. And we'll get to that. But let's kind of walk through the text that we did and look for some of these holy tensions. The first one's real obvious. We start in verse 9, and we remember that Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. That happened maybe, we're not exactly the, the exact timing here, but about a week before this, maybe 10 days or so. Jesus had been in Bethany, this had happened, and all the people heard about it. So Lazarus has been dead, and now he's been raised to life. You and I know a little secret, that today we're here on Palm Sunday, on Friday we're going to celebrate Jesus' death, and next week Sunday, we call it Easter, but it's called Resurrection Sunday. There's all sorts of these death, life things happening right now. But it really comes to us when we hear about what the Jewish leaders are planning to do. So they're upset that all of this attention is happening for Jesus. But now Lazarus too. So what do they do? They're not only after Jesus, they're after Lazarus. To do what? Arrest him, reprimand him? Uh-uh. They're going to kill him. What? The guy's been dead. He's been resurrected. A week and a half later, he gets news that he's uh, got a warrant out for a death arrest. Can you just imagine the guy going, oh, come on, I've been there, done that. <laughs> death and life sort of packaged right together here in this confusing idea. But also a little bit to remind us of what is coming, life. Second one here, let's look at the ups and downs. And literally speaking, there's an up and down that happens in their journey. So that area of Israel is very hilly. 
And if you know something about the Psalms and about the journey of God's people, you often hear people say, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. It's always up to Jerusalem. It's not because Jerusalem is the highest point, but it is both an emotional and spiritual journey that you're going up on. And yet, Jerusalem is on a hill. But so is Bethany. In fact, as you can tell from here, this is the journey from Bethany. So behind these people walking, if you, kept, if you turned around and walked the other way, you'd get to Bethany. So you're going downhill from Bethany, down, into the Kidron Valley. It goes down, 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 and then you turn or you come right back up. You see where the gold dome is in the middle? That's now a mosque, but at the time of Jesus, that was the brand spanking new beautiful temple. So when they say they're going to Jerusalem, they're going down to go up to be there, physically speaking. So that's one way of noticing it. But you can sense in this whole story the emotions that go down and up and the story that just sort of jig-jags every way. It's not one of these calmly written stories that allows you to just stay on an even plane or grow one way. It's coming it at you emotionally, up and down. In fact, we see that in the rejoicing and weeping. When Luke tells the story of Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem, he says, when they came to that area there, the Mount of Olives, the crowd is joyfully praising in loud voices. They were so boisterous that the Pharisees around them told Jesus, you should scold your people. You need to tell them to be quiet. And some of you know what Jesus said back. If I tell them to be quiet, the very stones will cry out. So all that loud, cheering, joyful partying is going on, maybe some dancing. In the very next verse of that in Luke, we see that when Jesus looked over all of that, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. We don't know where those tiny little secret tears that rolled down his cheeks or did his shoulders shake with grief over it? Either way, his tears fell in contrast to the cheers of the people. Peace and war. Now in verse 13, we hear it's very, it's almost like this is the theme verse for Palm Sunday. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. That's the cheer that's going up. And what are they waving? Palm branches. Okay, we've got these symbols and these words. And if you don't stop and pay some attention to it, you don't realize how much holy tension is going on just with those two things, just within the palm branches and those words. For instance... These palm branches, they're so pretty and beautiful, and they wave nicely in the air. We get this idea that they're meant to convey peace and innocence in here. Mm. But underneath those palm branches, looking so innocent, is nationalism and rebellion. How do we know this? See, during the war with Rome, images of palms, palm trees, were pressed into the coins of the Jewish, Jewish state. And at that time, that was the Jewish rebellion state, fighting against Rome. This was a symbol that said to them, hey, fight for your freedom. National symbol. And we know this also because palm branches became that way during the time of the Maccabeans. It's so about 200 years before the time of Jesus, there had been an occupation of Israel at that time. The Greeks occupied them. It was one of the few times that a small ragtag group of Maccabean Jewish rebels were able to successfully fight against the Greeks and push them back. And their symbol was the palm branch. Oh, and for 200 years now of new occupation, now not by the Greeks, but by the Romans, you can get a sense now when you picked up a palm branch and said, blessed is he who comes, 
you're not necessarily asking for, oh, isn't this sweet and peaceful like we do with our children? That's what we think. You can sense the rebellion behind it, the frustration with being an occupied people, the desire to be free. Sometimes we criticize the crowd. They really didn't understand that Jesus wasn't there for political reasons and he was there to save them from their sins. And we sit on our high horses 2,000 years later with all the benefits that we've had looking backward in time. But if you were there at that time and you had to live under that oppression, can you understand why picking up that palm branch would have this kind of idea for you. I want to be free. And oh yes, Jesus will give that to you. Not in the way you anticipate. But there's another tension. Prayer and praise. And there we talk about the word Hosanna. Hosanna is literally, it's from Hebrew, it's kind of a alliterative word there, and it means, save us. It's a plea, it's a cry, it's a prayer. Oh Lord, save us, Hosanna. And at the very same time, it is the cry that you give to give thanks for being saved. Lord, please save us. And Hosanna, we are saved. This day and age, we tend to use the word only in one way. We use it almost similarly to hallelujah. You can say hallelujah, you can say Hosanna. It means the same thing. Praise the Lord, we'll say. Careful, not quite. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hosanna is save us. And when they're uttering that word, they're crying out to God, to be saved. Some of them, yes, from the Romans. Some of them from our sins. Some of them not really knowing, but it was a prayer. And at the very same time, a praise, all in the same word, that we be saved. Honor and humility. Some of you know about this one, right? Jesus riding on a donkey. And so we immediately think, wow. It would be honorable if he rode a great white steed into Jerusalem. That's what kings, conquering kings, would ride the biggest horse around and come into the city. That's true. That was true of the Romans. And so Roman observers who might have been seeing this going on, you can imagine them going, <laughs> what a fool. They are calling him the king of Israel, and he's riding on a, not just a donkey, but a baby donkey. Come on. But don't go too far with that, because in Jewish tradition, it was not considered uh, that it was so great to ride a great white horse. In Jewish tradition, riding a donkey did have honor. In fact, we hear in the prophets that the king will come to them riding on a donkey. We heard it as our call to worship. Don't be afraid. This is how your king will arrive. And the people knew that. So the Romans have one view of this. The Jewish people have another view. They're all there on the road together. There's this, who is Jesus? Honor, or is he being humiliated or humble, right? He's not being humiliated. He is being humble here. Jesus, humble and meek, and yet, as Zephaniah says, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. All of those opposites on Palm Sunday point out why it's so hard to know how to approach this day. What do we do with a day like this? We don't know whether to laugh or cry. We're not sure if we should wear shades of gray or is it time to break out the spring wardrobe? Is it eager excitement? Do we think that singing Hosanna here is really just a warm-up for hallelujah next week? But wait, 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 we've got Good Friday in between and we're going to sing, alas, and did my Savior bleed. What do we do with this day? And we're not even really sure what to do with Jesus in these scenes that happen in this week. Jesus himself is presenting who he is with what feels like some holy tension. 
Depending on how we look at some of the scenes that happen during Holy Week, we're not sure whether to emphasize Jesus, the human person, or Jesus, the divine Son of God. Today, Palm Sunday, we talk about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And um, so then we know, we can see how Jesus is participating in these holy tensions. But as we look at the story of what's going to happen the rest of the week, the way we understand it is the very next day, so probably would be tomorrow, Monday, Jesus and the disciples take a walk from Bethany, downhill and back uphill again. They encounter a fig tree, and Jesus is hungry. Jesus, the human person, is hungry. There's no figs on the tree. So Jesus curses the tree. And it works. Jesus is divine. Right there. Two of these very opposite things happening. And then Jesus goes into the temple and we read there that he overturns the, the tables of the merchants and the money changers. Some people say that that whole scene of Jesus getting mad and turning things over proves Jesus is human and that it's his humanity in which he gets angry. And therefore, because Jesus gets angry, so can I. Let's be really careful what we do with the text there. That's not the purpose of it. Scripture does say, by the way, be angry and sin not, do not sin. But that's in another place. This story is not about Jesus being so human that he got angry and turned the tables over. Physically, we see him as a human being, capable of tossing tables and chairs and whatever. But if you look at the Old Testament, you have to recognize that God had been righteously angry with his people for their poor use of worship for generations. And it's, there's many, many verses, we won't go into that today, where God says, I hate your feasts because your heart isn't right. I hate what you're pretending to do because you're not really worshiping me. So God, the Father, his anger is played out by Jesus, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. This is divine and holy anger. Jesus, in that action, human and divine. A little later in the week, we talked about this. There's this dinner party that's thrown, and Mary anoints Jesus with oil and wipes his feet with her hair. And the anointing that happens on his head drips down into his beard. That anointing, very physical thing. Jesus is sitting there at a meal. He's eating like a human being. But when he gets anointed, we're reminded that this is someone special. Anointing was reserved only for priests and kings. Sitting around the table there, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and the disciples and maybe other guests, no one else was figuring this out. Mary, who had sat at the feet of Jesus, got it. This man with whom I'm eating, who just said, pass the figs, please, is the Son of God. He is divine, and she anoints him. Holy tension. If we're going to understand Palm Sunday... We need to acknowledge and do our best to hold on to these complexities, these holy tensions of the story. Again, some of them are just historically interesting. But there's a set of these that's really important to our faith. Meekness and majesty. Meekness, that Jesus the human man, leader of a ragtag group of fishermen, descendant of the line of King David, and majesty, Jesus, the divine Son of God, co-creator of the world and king for all eternity, was present in one person. Fully human. Fully divine. Now that sounds like opposite truths, two different camps, but we need both of them to be true in order to turn the horror of the coming week into life and hope for all who believe. Now that crowd that saw Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, the one that saw him in the flesh riding the donkey, 
Maybe his feet were dirty and he was a little sweaty from the walk and from the heat there. They saw calluses on his hands. Those who sat with him at the dinner party watched him eat. That's a very physical thing. I think for them, it was easy to acknowledge that Jesus was human. They could touch him. They could hear him. They could smell his garlic breath. I mean, have you ever eaten the food in the Middle East? We know that they didn't get it because we read that in our text. It says here, at first the disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him. The guy we have hung out with for all these years. The guy we went fishing with. It was only later that they got it. So their default position was to accept without argument that Jesus was human. But they had a harder time getting to the reality that Jesus was divine, the very Son of God. Here's what I'm curious about for us. If the default position of those first disciples of Jesus was to overemphasize Jesus' humanity, is it possible that we overemphasize his deity? Now that might catch some of us. <gasps> you can't even say that. It sounds ridiculous. Jesus is God. We know that. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the Son of God. How can you ever overemphasize? And really, I don't think we can. But do we emphasize it to the point that we neglect the other? That's the concern. Now, there are plenty of people in our day and age who believe Jesus was a good man, a prophet, a wise, and an excellent teacher. But they mock the idea, they laugh at the idea that Jesus was divine. And so maybe it is that those of us in the church feel that to hold ground on the faith, we need to continually emphasize Christ's deity. And so be it if we don't talk so much about his humanity. We're defending the faith against those who are pushing against it. You know, for generations we have defended this. That's been part of how we've been raised in the church. We sing about Jesus. It's in our doctrines. We, we do Bible studies about Jesus, the divine Son of God. Maybe we are afraid of giving ground to those who say he was just human. But that's not what we're saying when we say Jesus was fully human. He was. He wasn't just human. He wasn't just divine. He was fully human. He was fully divine. And the world will say to us, you can't have it both ways. And I suggest we say back to them, that's nonsense. We must have it both ways. Because if Jesus was just a pretend God, if he was not truly God, but pretended, had some tricks on his hand, he would not be able to be the sacrifice for us. A human was needed to pay for our sins. But if he was fully God, but just dressed up like a human, again, he couldn't substitute for us. If he had been human, only human, he would have his own sin to atone for. He wouldn't have been able to take care of ours. Do you under understand the dilemma of what happens when you have to pick one or the other? And yet, do you feel some of the temptation of our generation to lean in one way over the other? Palm Sunday invites us to stand where the tension is, to look at both, to understand that both of those things come true in Jesus. Christians have struggled to understand this mystery for centuries. It's a bit like the Trinity. There are things that we do our best to grasp. 
And to be honest, in some ways it may scramble your brain a bit to hold two things true at the same time. We showed that we actually have words in our language, and I would guess in many languages, that do it. So we can do it. We have to be careful not to be too simplistic about falling off one side or the other. We need to understand the tension of Jesus' humanity and deity. We need to believe it. This is what saves us. Because if these weren't true, it wouldn't. Here's how some of our creeds through the centuries have helped us. The Athanasian Creed, about 300 years after Christ. Now this is true faith, that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. It's a statement. It's a statement that we have to ponder. And we have to investigate but it's part of our faith. In the Belgic Confession, Article 19, says this. These are the reasons why we confess him to be true God and true man. He is true God in order to conquer death by his power. No human could do that. And he is true man that he might die for us in the weakness of our flesh. If you need some reminders in time, of how to balance these two things. Here are two statements you can reflect on later. In this drama season of Lent, this six weeks journey we've been on, Palm Sunday kind of gets low billing on it. It's the understudy to Easter when the real action happens. But this day needs to stick with us. It needs to grab us with all of its holy tensions. Be aware, even, in yourself. I'm not sure what to do with this day. Dismiss it. Oh, don't do that. Allow the tensions to pull you this way and the other way. Am I happy? Am I sad? I don't know. I feel them both. Understand that's what this day is for. In a moment, we're going to actually experience this. The kids are going to come in. They've got some extra palm branches. They're going to hand them to some of us. We're going to close by singing a song, Hosanna, just like the people did. And then right after that, we're going to hear our Lenten reading and snuff out a candle. Now, people who plan worship services or events, they're told, don't jerk the people around. If you're heading in a direction of joyfulness, don't all of a sudden do a sad song. If you're wanting them to ponder something quietly, don't start with a happy song. Well, we're doing that. We're, we're jerking our own emotions back and forth. Why? That's what this day does to us. We know with the benefit of so many years and experience and reading the scriptures after what happens here, we know what's ahead in the coming week. We know that on Friday, Jesus, the human son born of Mary and the divine son of the Most High God, will submit himself to the torture and punishment of the cross. So we must hold these things together because this is life for us. His life, then his death, will reverse our death and give us life. And then we will, for all eternity, be able to say, it is the best of times. It is the best of times. Let's pray, and then our kids are going to come in, and we're going to sing, and then we're going to be somber again. Lord, thank you for your word to us. Thank you that in some very strange ways, your word does actually mirror our lives, our lives that we try to make sense of and try to put them in a box being one way or the other. And when we're honest, the reality is that it's kind of mixed up and there are tensions between various aspects. Thank you that we can see those tensions reflected in your word. And on this day, this Palm Sunday, 
May we acknowledge that for you, Lord, riding in on that donkey, being cheered by the crowd and being called upon to save them, that experience of tension that must have been within him, that he knew that he would indeed save, but the cost that it would be. And it would not accomplish the political salvation that they sought. Lord, help us to understand your word. And especially in this season, to apply it to our lives with thanksgiving that you are our human Savior who knows us intimately because you walked as a human on this earth and as a human died in our place. And at the very same time, we can worship and adore you, King of kings and Lord of lords, for you are God yourself. Lord Jesus, be glorified in all that we do and say this week. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>